Hello everybody, it is me Trent and today I'm doing a audiobook of my book I wrote called Prison Pandemonium. Now I was just going to just read it monotone like chapter one, but I think that's really boring. Um, so we're just going to read this. Um, I'll probably do each chapter or a couple of chapters each session. So that's exciting. So if you, for, if you purchase the book, I doubt it because like people don't really buy my books but if you do and you want to follow along go ahead and turn the page to chapter one so we have act one so this book is split up into four acts okay chapter one georgina georgina bradley was the ripe age of 22 and she had her whole life ahead of her that is until she murdered a man she was now in prison for life and she didn't regret one bit of what she did to the bastard that had abused her Georgina had a boyfriend who would constantly beat and rape her, and one night she finally had enough. While he was sleeping, she grabbed a kitchen knife and sliced his dick off. In her eyes, it was justice, sweet, poetic justice. However, in the eyes of the court system, Georgina needed to be punished, so she was sent to Brooklyn Falls Penitentiary, home of quite a few characters, if she did say so herself. The prison was split up by gender, and it was severely overpopulated. There had been a recent surge in crimes, which caused police officers in the justice system to send millions of people behind bars. Sometimes in Brooklyn Falls, Georgina felt like there wasn't even enough room to breathe. Georgina tried keeping to herself when she first got to prison, which was only last fall. However, a few of the women befriended her very quickly. Georgina didn't want to have any loyalties in prison, but she didn't have much choice. Who knew what they would have done to her had she denied? The women's names were Deidre Perkins, Augusta Murillo, and Sherry Chavez. Deidre was the same age as Georgina and seemed to understand her the most out of the three. When Georgina told Deidre about what she had done to her boyfriend, Deidre smirked. Bastard had it coming, she had said. Augusta was in jail for bankruptcy, and she didn't seem to mind. People theorized that she turned herself in in order to avoid the hell that resided outside of the prison walls. Allegedly, she had been dirt poor and could barely pay the bills. She didn't have any children, no spouse, and no one that needed to rely on her besides herself. So why not go to prison? Free food, free shelter. Sherry was the oldest out of the three, at the age of 63. Sherry never liked to discuss what she had done, but it must have been horrific considering she had been in prison since 1990. One thing that Georgina noticed about the prison was that everyone had their own little cliques, in a sense. It was a lot like high school. You had the Methies, as Deidre crudely called them. The leader of the Methies was a woman named Elizabeth Davis. Georgina didn't know very many of the others within the tightly knit group, but she knew two others named Lupe Maynard and Jimmy Ramos, though nobody called them by their first names. Maynard was always harassing the other prisoners, asking around for anyone selling dope. Ramus, on the other hand, never talked to anyone, not even to Davis or Maynard, who constantly made fun of and berated her for it. Next up were the biker chicks, which Deidre had also coined. Georgina only knew the leader by her last name, Skinner. No one messed with her, and most people had decided that she was the alpha on this side of the prison. It wasn't anything that anyone had agreed on, it was unspoken. Skinner always had favorite things. Her favorite shower, her favorite stall, favorite sink, you name it. One time, a new girl named Dina Kane took Skinner's spot in the shower, and Skinner later on got one of her minions to beat Dina's ass. No one fully knows what happened to Dina, but allegedly half of her face was skinned off by a cheese grater that Skinner had taken from the kitchen. Dina and Skinner's minion were sent into solitary confinement, which everyone called The Box. Skinner received her name for a reason. It was her last name, and everyone went by last names around here. She had also skinned many people who had crossed her on various parts of their bodies. She was in prison because she knocked her cheating husband unconscious, grabbed a potato peeler, and skinned her husband's dick. He screamed until she began skinning every last inch of flesh off of his body. Georgina felt like her crime was tame compared to Skinner's. It was June 22nd, 2030, and everyone was in the cafeteria. Surprisingly, the prisoners were allowed to watch the news. They had many things taken away from them, such as a microwave and utensils, so now they only ate finger foods. Deidre, Georgina, Sher Sherry, and Augusta watched in amusement as politicians argued on the news. Nice tits, yelled one of the girls. The cafeteria erupted into laughter. Suddenly, the news broadcast was interrupted by a man wearing a stricken expression. 
As you all know, the population inside of prisons across the world are at an all-time high. We are running out of places to put the world's criminals. In a second, I will take you to the president where he will discuss. The TV cut off before any of them could hear what was about to be said. The fuck? Deidre exclaimed. Watch it, Perkins. A guard snapped. Deidre rolled her eyes and went back to her food. The prisoners were living in blissful ignorance, which, when looking back, Georgina would grow to envy such bliss, because the torments that they were all going to endure later on would be unmatched. Chapter 2. Charlie. Richard Charlie Bryant was coined the nickname Charlie by his fellow prisoners, simply because he was heavily inspired by Charles Guiteau's murder of President Garfield in 1881. Charlie was a lost cause, always had been. He had undiagnosed schizophrenia, and when he was fired from his job at the local grocery store, he felt it was his divine right to strangle one of his co-workers with a phone cord. It's my divine right, Charlie had screamed as he tightened the cord around his co-worker's neck. Eventually, someone intervened and managed to get Charlie off of his co-worker. However, Charlie man grabbed... <laughs> Sorry. Charlie grabbed a box cutter and slit the man's throat. It's my divine right, you fucking cocksuckers, Charlie screamed as the man bled out on the floor. That was 22 years ago, and he was serving life behind bars. Charlie seemed peaceful enough around his fellow prisoners, mainly because none of them bothered to talk to him because of his past. There was one incident back in 2012 where a pedophile was put behind bars. One of the guards accidentally left the door open, and the prisoners came and attacked the man, led by Charlie, screaming about their divine right right to absolutely desecrate this disgusting human filth who thought it appropriate to touch little girls. The man had a broken neck, a broken nose, broken fingers, and a broken skull, ending his reign of terror. Attaboy, Charlie, it's your divine right, a prisoner named Johnny Middleton had proclaimed after Charlie stomped on the man's head. The guards didn't punish Charlie either. They said that they didn't know who had killed the man, and Charlie got off scot-free. Charlie had gained the respect of a lot of prisoners and guards alike that day. Charlie was an observer. He took a watchful eye to each of his peers, trying to figure them out what their ulterior motives could be, what lay within each of their cold, decrepit hearts. There were a handful of people that Charlie constantly kept an eye out for. Felton O'Neill was the first. Charlie felt like he related the most to Felton. He was quiet, reserved, and antisocial. He was always found reading a book, usually Stephen King, or simply fidgeting with his hands. Felton was one of many men that Rico Rush loved to harass. Rico, or Rush as everyone else called him, was the head dog inside the male portion of the prison, and he made everyone his bitch. Rush would taunt Felton, but he simply wouldn't entertain such tomfoolery, as Felton had said straight to Rush's face. The next person was Theo Jones, who always ass kissed Rush. Rush saw right through this, of course, but he didn't mind it at all. After all, he had another brainless dumbass that would do absolutely anything he asked. Theo seemed scared of what Charlie wasn't sure, but any time that Rush came near him, you could see him start shaking. Micro shakes, Charlie called them. You could only notice them if you looked close enough. Charlie assumed that Rush was blackmailing Theo for something, or that maybe Rush had done something awful to Theo that they that he would never talk about. Teddy Ashley, or Teddy Bear as everyone called him, was a strange case. He always wanted to outshine Rush in any way that he could. Teddy thought his hatred and competitiveness towards Rush was subtle, but it was anything but subtle. Eventually, that animosity would catch up to him, and Charlie was just waiting for it. Nestor Gaines was Rush's second-hand man, and he was arrested for robbing a bank and killing a few people. He was a sadist, to put it bluntly. He enjoyed and got off on the suffering of others around him. The male side had a TV, just as the female side did, but the male side had more luxuries, such as better food, a microwave, and actual plastic utensils. There was loads of misogyny and sexism in Brooklyn Falls Penitentiary, and nothing seemed to be done about it. Some of the female guards expressed outrage about the favored treatment towards the men, but the male guards blatantly disregarded those who discussed it. They just didn't care enough. So Charlie was sitting in the main area, observing his usuals. Theo was at the back of the room, sitting with Johnny Middleton. Rush and Nestor sat at the very front, along with more of Rush's posse. They always got the front table, and if anyone tried to fight Rush on that, they would be beaten. Violence was a lot more common on the male side, mixing raging testosterone and men that have the, that have had their freedom taken away from them wasn't a good combination. Most of them had nothing left to lose. O'Neill sat, reading The Green Mile by Stephen King, the irony of it all. 
Teddy Bear sat at the same table with Charlie, which made his observations all the more easier. Animosity seemed to radiate off of Teddy when he looked in Rush's direction. The TV was on the news station, which was the default station the prisoners were allowed to watch, excluding special occasions. Charlie was paying no mind to what the assholes on television were saying. It was his God-given right to ignore the bullshit they spewed from their traps. However, Charlie decided to pay attention when the president came on. This was bound to be important if an, if an emergency presidential conference was live. As you all know, the prison populations all around the globe have grown exponentially. We are running out of room in these prisons, and because of that, riots are beginning to break out inside said prisons, and the living conditions are becoming unbearable, said the president. More unbearable than they already are, Johnny Middleton said. A few of the men shot him looks before turning their heads back towards the screen. I have a proposition, something to keep things in order. You have to make some sacrifices. So I'm announcing this with a heavy heart. Starting in three days, every guard will be evacuated from dozens of the most populated prisons in, across the world, and weapons will be thrown in. Then, the prisoners will be allowed to commit as much crime as they want. After a week's time, the remaining prisoners that are still alive will be allowed freedom, with their sentence suspended. This sparked outrage from the crowd, and reporters began to swarm the president, shoving their microphones into his face, demanding a story. The president will give no statements at this time, the president's secretary said, rushing Mr. President off camera. Silence settled among the prisoners, and Charlie observed this with great interest. There were very mixed reactions all around the room. There were those who had grins on their faces, such as Nestor Gaines, those who seemed terrified, such as Theo Jones, and those who were indifferent, such as Felton and Charlie himself. Turn that shit off, a guard yelled. Don't give these assholes any ideas, he continued. A smug look crossed Rush's face. What ideas? Rush asked. We're just listening to the news of the outside world. What's so wrong with that? The guard response told Charlie everything he needed to know, along with everyone else. Brooklyn Falls Penitentiary would be one of those dozens of prisons that Mr. President was talking about. Chapter 3, Dina. Ever since Dina was little, people constantly called her Cain. Cain killed Abel, and because of that, he was shunned and forced to wander. It was how Dina had felt her entire life. Dina had been caught stealing pain medication for herself because she was in chronic pain due to a car accident that left her back fucked up all to hell. The hospital had just brushed her off as a junkie, and since she stole the meds, she was sent to this hellhole, where that bitch Skinner got her posse to skin half of her face off with a cheese grater, all because she stole her spot in the shower. She had been in the box ever since, along with the girl who had skinned her face. Now she had two pains, the one in her back and the pain where half of her face used to be. Dina didn't know the bitch's name, but guards always called her Hartman. She could hear Hartman screaming in the room next to hers, pounding on the walls and begging to get out. All Dina wanted to do was rip her fucking face off. When she had been sent to the box, she had cried a lot, which burned her skinned face. Doctors came in and out and treated her for the wounds that Hartman had given her because of Skinner. She dreamed of revenge, of hurting that bitch in the same way she had been hurt. She didn't just get to live life normally in this prison after horrifically mutilating someone in the way she had. All because of Skinner? Dina knew she would have little to no chance against Skinner, but she could dream. One thing that Dina noticed was that less guards were in the box. Like, a lot less. There were usually around ten officers and guards patrolling the box, but now there were only three. She had heard from the walls that something bad was happening. Something very bad. Nothing much could be worse in Dina's eyes than being locked in a cage like a fucking animal with half of your face missing and on top of that being locked in this cage with the predator who scarred you sleep didn't come easy to dina but she tried her best to ignore her back pain and slept dreamlessly